It's been a background element of multiple packets of discourse for a while, in which fans of wholesome media and fans of dark fic are constantly at each other's throats in a high-stakes battle over a raging lava flow to see who gets the honor of ruining media for everyone else. Will it be the lovers of wholesome media who will sanitize the edges off everything and everyone until we're all watching nice, baby-faced golden boys give speeches about friendship like a youth pastor in a pastel gay conversion camp? Or will it be the lovers of dark fic who will wash the world in sinful, bloody degeneracy like you've released a Catholic priest in a preschool? Or a weeb in a preschool? or a conservative politician in a preschool, or a guy with a rifle in an American preschool, or a Gonna be honest, even I don't know where I'm going with this. I just started typing and opinions came out. Okay, so fandom's always had this problem where everyone is different and has different opinions on everything, but they're also insular and all feel increasingly entitled to be agreed with. While discourse often gets dressed up with academic sounding terms like media literacy and purity culture, and these terms have tangible meanings, they're also terms that are easy to weaponize as a more objective sounding phrase for someone who just disagreed with you. See, this is the real problem of progressive language politics. Because we made it an instant mortal sin to call someone the R word, the raging cotton hills of the world just appropriated academic sounding language to call someone the R word, but in a glittery way with fireworks arranged as skull emojis. Yeah, slurs like the R word are vile, but there are advantages to just having terrible people openly identify as such up front so you could just avoid or do something about them from the get-go. Because when someone bitches about the death of media literacy, there's a whole checklist to go through to see if that person actually has a real point to make, or if they just have a Nebula subscription and an ego. No shade to Nebula, but people who watch smart YouTubers often like to think that automatically makes them smart as well, and it just doesn't. This has been the backbone of media discourse since the early days of YouTube. It used to be people would whine about, you're stating something as fact, when it's really your opinion. Of course, anyone with two brain cells to rub together already knows that subjectivity is implied in media discourse. But it didn't matter to that guy. That guy heard an opinion he didn't like, and he got mad about it. YouTubers used to have to pepper their videos with near-constant reassurances about subjectivity, on the off chance that we wouldn't have to deal with someone throwing a screeching shit fit in our comment section. We don't do that anymore, because it never worked and the kind of drooling simpleton who had the shit fit in the first place has only gotten drowned out in the noise of short-form social media. We've all accepted that you can't be reasonable with an inherently unreasonable person. But over the years, as fandom has become more tribalistic, less intelligent, and more insular, an increasingly present argument has cropped up. And that's the debate over wholesome media versus dark media. Well, I say debate, but it's more like two people in different bedrooms posting Twitter rants about how the other guy is totally not capable of handling the real world. And to an extent, I can see the tumor of an idea forming in their head, but that's the problem. It's a tumor. So the argument in one direction is that people who consume only wholesome, friendly media want their fiction to be a warm blanket. Someone who seeks escapism and only escapism in all its forms. People who view dark or violent content as inherent flaws. It's certainly easy to see how that stereotype formed. The fan bases for the bigger, wholesome shows about love and friendship turned out to be festering piles of mutated slurry. Interact with the fan base for My Little Pony or Steven Universe long enough and you'll have a horror story eventually. What was your favorite brony controversy? The child they harassed for saying they're cringe? The child they harassed for saying they're cringe, or the child they harassed for saying they're cringe? How about the time a child predator was outed? Or the time a child predator was outed? Or the time a child predator was outed? How about the trans woman they harassed for talking about their abuse? Or the trans woman they harassed for talking about the- Wait, hang on, that was me, wasn't it? What was your favorite controversy in the Steven Universe fandom? That time they harassed an artist for drawing skinny rows and then went really quiet when the creator did it? That time they harassed a Make-A-Wish kid for posting about an episode they got to see early? Or the time they spent half a decade making up a lie about how the reputation of the series was ruined because a video criticizing the show got popped. Wait, hang on, that was me, wasn't it? The thing is, I'm not sure I'd blame the behavior of these fan bases on the fact that they only want escapism. Bronies were a cross section of weebs and fascists, while Steven Universe always reeked of consumption based progressivism. A lot of wholesome media skews progressive because treating people with kindness is, unfortunately, now a political position. And when these shows skew progressive in presentation, it attracts an audience that wants progressive media. The problem is that the media and the creators aren't perfect and are subject to criticism. And the audience are using that media as a proxy replacement for their own virtues. Hold on to this, we're going to come back to it later. So when you exist in the basic reality of discourse and critical thinking, fans who wrap themselves in a duvet to avoid any real personal growth will increasingly feel attacked and get increasingly aggressive. Never was this more apparent to me than with Steven Universe, where I criticize it maybe once every two years and you'd swear I murdered the fan base's dog. They have an entire mythology that I ruined the reputation of a show and the creator, which is just an obvious lie. Steven Universe is rated on IMDb at 8 8.2 out of 10. On Google, it's rated a 4.7 stars out of 5, and its ratings per episode were higher than any other cartoon released that decade, with the exception of Teen Titans Go. 
I never tarnished its reputation. Steven Universe is universally beloved. But we all know how that goes. We've seen Zelda fans throw a fucking shit fit over a 7 out of 10 review. We know 8.2 isn't good enough for a work that is treated like the second coming of Jesus. Anything less than a perfect 10 out of 10 isn't good enough. Truth is, I don't see a lot of people criticizing Steven Universe. I see a hell of a lot of people having screaming shit fits about criticism of Steven Universe, but I sure as fuck don't see criticism on the scale we did six years ago because the fan base harassed everybody into silence. But when your entire worldview revolves around a show from 10 years ago being treated unfairly because you had to suffer the indignity of knowing people who don't agree with you exist, yeah, you probably will think it was treated unfairly because anything less than godlike worship is unfair in your eyes. And when you're a fandom-brained moron who thinks consumption is activism and your leftism is tied up entirely in consuming the correct products, you will think any contradicting opinion must come from a, what phrase did that child left behind say? The obvious bad faith, unironically everything phobic. Because otherwise, your idea of yourself is going to be cracked in some way. And we all know how people who use fandom as a wallpaper for their noxious personalities get when they have to confront reality. This is the core reason why social media, especially short-form social media, is just so nasty all the time. Because narcissism like this is born from insecurity, and any contradicting opinion wounds an easily wounded ego. And because we're talking about the average Twitter user, you have to also contend with the fact that their mothers drop them on their heads as infants. So they'll hear a contradicting opinion, not like it, not be smart enough to argue against it and fall back on circular non-arguments, fishing buzzwords out of a bag until they find one that makes that person shut up. The only reason you see this attitude with wholesome media over dark media is because oftentimes the wholesome media is the one that takes objectively correct stances about the world, like freedom is good and gay people are rad and all Nazis should die. And so people for whom consumption is activism tend to gravitate toward it. But they'd be doing this regardless of the media, it's just that a lot of dark content is a lot more difficult to virtue signal with. You could make an argument that by watching a cartoon with good messages, I am inherently doing good. It would be bullshit and the height of how our values are shaped to serve capitalism at the end of the day, but you could try to do it, and it's easy to want to do it, because binge-watching is easy and thinking about what you consume is difficult. Conversely, why don't you try and make a leftist position, no matter how bullshit it is, out of the human centipede? That's what I thought. That doesn't mean people don't try, however, and in fact, we just went over it. See, people who prefer cozy, wholesome media and who need to make their consumption into activism tend to be extremely aggressive about criticism or discourse because they're not very bright and their ego is tied to something that's usually deeply flawed. So it's easy to draw a line between the two and claim, well, you're like this because you've wrapped yourself in a duvet of escapism and can't contend with the real world. Unlike me, who reads the most decadent filth imaginable and am therefore more well-adjusted and mature and able to exist in the real world. Until you tell them it's weird that they're beating it to a story about a guy being psychologically battered by his sister, then they'll screech about fiction versus reality like a weeb caught in a preschool. Despite the differences in behavior and stated intent, the same fundamental problem exists in both of those people. For as much as one might claim that their tastes in media don't say anything about them as a person, they both want their tastes in media to say positive things about them. The guy jacking it to the cement garden will also turn around and screech about the puritines and purity culture and aunties and prudish puritanical American values, so it's clear on some level they think consumption is activism. See, people can have completely different behaviors and attitudes, but have them come from the same place. And the truth is, regardless of the media in question, hardcore fans who make media their entire identity will always try and make their media consumption into something higher and more important than it actually is. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to justify spending so much time on it. This isn't new. Just 10 years ago, during the villain redemption boom, there were people arguing that sympathizing with villains and pushing for redemption was a sign of being really empathetic, and how if you don't like villain redemptions, it's a symptom of Catholic purity culture. Oh, did you not sympathize with the 800th Zuko clone? That is deeply troubling, sweaty. People online have been trying to make consumption into a personality for as long as there has been an online. And it's not that it's gotten worse, it's just gotten more visible since online communities moved off isolated forums and into the short-form cesspit that is Twitter. And Twitter is like if 4chan got drowned in corporate branding. We can argue about how you can't make a judgment on someone based on their media taste, but the people who say that often then try and make those same judgments about themselves. And the thing is, 
you can judge someone on their media tastes. If someone told me their favorite film was Birth of a Nation, I'd get as far away from that person as possible, because that's a Nazi I'm talking to. But you can't do that in the milquetoast swamp that is the PGTV to M-rated game family zone. That's where media is just not on the same level, Everything is sanitized and watered down, even if it claims to be the dark, gritty, violent, toxic Yuri you've always wanted. It's just not. You guys remember last year when Twitter practically blew up over the coffin of Andy and Lele, with people who hadn't played it thinking it was like the human centipede had angry, violent sex with flowers in the attic, and its fans were waggling their tongues over how transgressive and boundary-pushing and not for the puritines it was? Then someone took time to actually play it, and inside it was a really milquetoast story about a guy being psychological logically abused by someone who looks and acts like she still has live journal in 2024. With the way people were talking, you'd probably expect something utterly shameless that threw off all societal taboos and screamed, look at me, but it was actually weirdly insecure. Too afraid of its own content to go further than the same kind of jokes people have been making about siblings for years, dressed up in 2020's dark fic with a weirdly noir aesthetic. About the only unique thing it did was it accurately reflected the suffocating mundanity of an abusive relationship, and it does so by being so boring you feel like you're in purgatory. It was quite quite literally a nothing burger, the video game equivalent of a 14-year-old boy saying shocking and offensive things to make his parents gasp. What little artistic merit it had was buried under duck faces and kitty mouths. I don't think many people have taken notice of this in that a lot of the media being championed as dark, transgressive taboo is actually quite toothless banging on there being a bunch of people performatively expressing their outrage, and a bunch of other sadder people performatively hyping it up because the target audience is mostly teenagers, and people who haven't matured past being a teenager. Usually, they don't hold up when literally anyone else starts examining it more closely because it was all supposed to be a maypole for people who still have to yell at their mom to get out of their room. This was the case with the weird true crime soap opera boom. If you're into serial killers as a concept, you watch documentaries, but the only reason to watch this shit is, one, you're attracted to the lead actor, and two, you're giggling to your yourself about how the Twitter puritines are going to be so mad. This itself isn't new, this is the founding mantra of 4chan, doing extremely off-putting shit to get a rise out of people, and like all of the shit that came after it, 4chan users would write an entire dissertations about how behaving this way is actually a completely normal thing to do, and doesn't speak to a deep insecurity and craving for attention and validation. And Twitter, being the bastard child of 4chan, is just that but bigger. This is going to be one of those videos where I tell you the blatantly obvious, but um, you know, I don't think these two groups of people who only like one thing are as well adjusted as they claim. Shocking revelation, I know, hot take of the century. The truth is, you're never going to win this argument no matter what side of it you're on, because the argument isn't about anything rational, it's entirely about ego. It's about people who spend too much of their time obsessing over one or two things, getting insecure about how they're spending their time, and viciously lashing out at anything that even slightly looks like it's calling them out for it. Hell, let's go back a decade. Remember Fifty Shades of Grey, a story that was marketed as some kind of taboo-pushing kink, but then you actually watch it, and it's just a sexist guy with mommy issues being a sexist guy with mommy issues. And a lot of people were saying this guy was putting off red flags to reach incel territory and the film was going to set people up for abusive relationships. But that never happened. And of course it didn't happen. Here's a question for you. How many guys with that level of mommy issues do you know who look like Christian Grey? None. Because in the movie, Christian Grey looks like evil Superman, whereas this kind of guy in real life looks like Teenage Snape. People acted like it was going to slander the BDSM community or give people false ideas about relationships, but the truth is, you're never going to find a man who is 6 foot 5, rich, muscular, that handsome, who is also suffering crippling, life-destroying trauma that makes them that damaged. Because with the exception of the height, you can't be all those other things while life-destroying trauma is making it impossible for you to get out of bed. Also, so, abusive delusional women with a brother complex who may or may not have tasted human flesh don't look like this, they look like this. Nobody thinks damaged people are hot. You think hot damaged people are hot. This was the same onus on villain redemptions a long time back. For all the poetic waxing about empathy, that empathy was only ever extended to people they found attractive. And the discussion about if your tastes in media say anything about you is one of gradation. Having one really fucked up book in your book collection doesn't really say anything about you, but having 16 of the bastards definitely does. Conversely, nobody really gives a shit if you liked Steven Universe. We certainly give a shit if your identity is so tied to Steven Universe, you're harassing Make-A-Wish children over it, or making entire 
mythologies about D-list critics ruining the reputation of a critically acclaimed series. I feel that Twitter has allowed this to become lost to misinformation, but this is what the term weeb originally means. Some people are under the impression weeb refers to anyone who likes anime, and no, no, it doesn't. Weebs just told everyone that. Weeb refers to someone who eats, breeds, and shits anime. Someone who thinks you can use anime, a product of late-stage capitalism, as a Rosetta Stone for Japan and Japanese culture. Someone who fetishizes an imaginary version of Japan as this magical place where capitalism is good and women are the ultimate trad wives. Someone who will say, it's just a drawing, in regards to child pornography, but then flip the hell out if you make a character black. I could keep listing examples until this video breaches the duration limit. Weebs are probably patient zero for someone who only consumes one kind of media, and who has written entire dissertations on why actually doing this is deeply cultured, and I'm a better class of person for engaging with foreign media. But they don't really engage with foreign media. They exclusively engage with a very tiny portion of a tiny portion of a tiny portion of foreign media that is made exclusively to appeal to their very rigid and often deeply racist and deeply misogynistic tastes. Hell, they're the reason their favorite hobby has such a bad reputation in North America, because the channels to find anime are often controlled or dominated by them, which means that if you wanted to find something enjoyable, then good fucking luck. People lie. They lie about their tastes, they lie about the extent to which they thought about their own tastes, and they aren't really trying to convince you with any of these arguments, they're trying to convince themselves. And the point I'm trying to make is that you don't actually need to do that because nobody really gives a shit, and that dissertation is going to raise way more red flags. People are a lot more easygoing when you don't proselytize. I've ripped the fuck out of weebs on this channel, and my wife and two of my friends are huge fans of anime. I've made jokes at the expense of furries who insist they're part of some transgressive movement. Two of my friends are furries. I was utterly ruthless to the coffin of Andy and Lele, and one of my friends thinks it's peak fiction, and they keep making this shit the utterly adorable son of a bitch. It's not the stuff you like that makes people dislike you. You are the reason people dislike you. Game of Thrones may as well be called the Incest and Dragon Show, and people en masse loved it, and they still love it. Flowers in the Attic is a classic, and there was such a demand for the sequels that the author had to hire a ghostwriter to keep up with it. But most people still don't like pro shippers because they won't get off their cracked broken soapbox and leave everyone else alone. Weebs, the world loves anime, and it's always loved anime, it just doesn't like you. Nobody likes you. And wholesome, uplifting shows like My Little Pony, Steven Universe, or Smiling Friends are among the most popular shows on the air. It's just that nobody likes the kind of person who makes these shows their entire personality because you keep harassing Make-A-Wish children and trans women. So when you're stuck in an argument with someone about how your taste in media makes you a more well-adjusted person, just remember, you're not.